Okay, I assume we can start. Okay, so so hi everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here again. Uh, it's always a lot of fun to to come and, and talk to you. And I'll also, I've, I'm thinking ahead about the third time that uh, the next talk already. So I will give uh, a teaser uh, in this uh, in this presentation. So so today's talk will be about uh, the verification of recurrent neural networks using invariant inference. And uh, feel free to to interrupt me with questions. Uh, you don't have to wait until the end. So before we get started with the technical stuff, so what I'll present today is based on an ATFA 2020 paper that was actually presented a few days ago. It was a joint work together with my student who has since graduated, Yuval, and our collaborator from Stanford, Clark Perrett. So uh, if Yuval hadn't graduated, he would be presenting probably today, but uh, as it is, you got me instead. So Katya asked me to give uh, a, a quick overview of the well, state of the art or some background on, on, um, on neural network verification. I assume most of you are familiar with most of what I'll, I'll show in the next few slides, but I, I'll uh, go ahead and, and give it anyway. So, you know, the, the general situation is that we want to create very complex systems that will satisfy very complex requirements, and we don't know how to do this manually. So we do this using uh, machine learning, and we get back an artifact, usually a deep neural network, uh, in, in today's context, uh, at least. And this uh, black box, this neural network satisfies the requirements mostly, but our goal is to certify that for any case, for any corner case that we might encounter, the neural network will behave as we expect. And the usual example that we give uh, as, as a motivating example for what can go wrong is this adversarial inputs, which again, I assume uh, you are familiar with. So basically you take an input that is correctly classified, for example, a panda, that when you give it to an image recognition network, it tells you that this is a panda. And then you slightly perturb it and you get another image, which still looks like a panda to a human, but to the neural network, this is now a gibbon with a very high level of confidence. Okay, so, so this is just one of the, of the problems uh, that we have in, in, in uh, deep neural networks today. And it's currently widely known that even state-of-the-art neural networks are vulnerable to this problem. And, and it's really a severe problem if, we, if we're thinking about deploying neural networks on critical systems. And you might say, okay, big deal. So a panda is misclassified as a gibbon, but we are concerned, for example, in the context of adversarial, uh, of, um, of autonomous driving, right? So what happens if you have a deep neural network that does uh, traffic light recognition and suddenly 11 pixels are, are added, are changed, and suddenly the image becomes a kitchen oven. And so, so the problems I think are, are fairly clear and we know that attacks exist also in the real world and that attackers are getting very good at this. And so our goal is to formally verify, to ensure that uh, our networks are robust before we deploy them. So this is the general motivation uh, to the problem. If anybody has any questions, I'll, I'll pause for a second. No, okay. So our goal is to develop techniques for formally verifying neural networks, right? So traditionally verification as a field has existed for, for many decades and you, you take a program and you take a specification and you formally prove that the program satisfies uh, the specification or you get back a counter example, right? You say to the user, well, look, you have a bug and here it is and, and the user can, uh, can use the bug to fix the program or, or uh, do whatever they want. And what we want to do, so verification of traditional software has been studied quite extensively, right? We know how to do this fairly well. Of course, it's not perfect, but we have some, some, um, you know, some information on, on how to do this efficiently. And the verification of neural networks, on the other hand, is, is fairly new, right? It's only existed for a few years now. And the idea is that you take your, your neural network and you look at the space of all possible inputs and the space of all possible outputs, and you define two subsets, P and Q, one is a subset of the input space, one is a subset of the output space. And you ask, does there exist a point in P that is mapped to Q? Okay, so so this, is, this looks like an easy or, or a simplistic formulation, but it has been observed that practically all the interesting problems that you want to solve on neural networks, all the interesting questions can be reduced to this setting. Well, probably not all of them, but many of them. Right? For example, adversarial robustness queries can be re reduced to this setting. So in neural network verification, this is the simple problem that we want to solve. Right, so typically Q is the negation of what we really want to show. So for example, Q might, pin Q here might mean that we are looking at images that are very close to the panda, that's P, 
and Q means that the image is misclassified. So these could be the points that are classified as gibbons. And so Q is typically the negation of what we really want to show. And if the verification problem results in a SAT answer, satisfying assignment is discovered, then this satisfying assignment is the point in P that is mapped to Q. This is our counter example. But if no such point exists, then we reply unsat and we know that our network is safe, right? It cannot make the mistake uh, that we were testing for. Any questions on this before we continue? No, okay. So one common thing that we do with, uh, with verification, which is really, I think, what, uh, what most people are, are working on because it's, it's fairly simple to formulate, is local adversarial robustness. Right? So if going back to the adversarial examples uh, problem, right? so you can define a measure of robustness. How robust is my network? And this robustness measures how much noise the adversary ha has to add before the first adversarial example can be reached. Right, so if my network has a, a high level of robustness, then a small amount of noise cannot fool it. Right? So this is the desirable situation. So for example, in this experiment, we took one neural network that does uh, airborne collision avoidance, doesn't really matter. And we took uh, five input points. Right? So five points in the input space, these are the rows of the table. And for each such point, we used verification to evaluate how robust the network is. So each column tells you how much noise the adversary is allowed to add. And uh, for example, you see that in point number two, for any level of noise that we tested, the network was robust. And so in this case, verification told us that the network could not be fooled, that it was robust to this uh, kind of problem. Whereas on, on point one, for example, we saw that if this amount of noise uh, is allowed, then an adversarial example exists. Whereas for smaller amounts of noise, no such example exists. And so this lets us quantify the limit, right? the amount of noise above which uh, we are vulnerable to adversarial examples. So this is just one, one kind of thing that you can do with verification in order to gain some confidence that your network is robust before you deploy it. Okay, so this is again just the survey part of, of my slide. So I will briefly mention some of the other things that you can do with uh, verification, right? Why is it useful? So the most obvious uh, holy grail, right, is the safety to prove safety properties of systems with DNN controllers. Right, so you have, for example, uh, a system that does collision avoidance for aircraft and it's controlled by uh, a deep neural network, but there's also an environment, right? When the deep neural network tells you something, the environment gets to react. So you, what you really want to prove is that the entire system is safe, right? So the environment plus the DNN controller, and this is something that you can use verification for, and people have, have started doing this. Uh, other things that you can do are simplification. So for example, today you have cases where you have neural networks that are very large. In fact, they are so large that it, it's becoming a problem to install them. For example, if you want to put a neural network on an edge device like a cell phone, or you have some embedded, soft, or some embedded uh, system, right, then you may have limited resources like memory or battery, and you don't want huge neural networks. Uh, also, the time that it takes to evaluate a network is, is, is very long for a large network. So maybe if you have uh, a situation where you need to respond very quickly, then you want smaller networks. So you can use verification to take a large neural network and shrink it, to simplify it in a way that gives you back a much smaller network that is mathematically completely equivalent to, to the original. Right, so in other, way, in other words, you can train your neural network, make it as big as you want, and then you can use verification to compress it without giving up on accuracy. Or if you are willing to give up on accuracy, you can probably simplify even more and you can mathematically prove that you never exceed this, um, this uh, inaccuracy that you have allowed. So this is something else that you can do with verification. And yet another application is to modify and repair your neural networks, right? So for example, if you have a neural network that you installed, suddenly a bug is discovered or maybe your, your specification changes, right? You want to use the neural network for something that it was not originally intended for. So one thing that you can do is you can retrain, right? You can create a brand new neural network, but this can be expensive. There are also situations where you don't have access to the training data or, or situations where you buy a neural network for the purpose of modifying it. There's actually, that's actually a thing now. Somebody sells you a neural network that is completely, almost completely trained and you do the fine tuning. So expensive uh, retraining may be impossible, but you can use verification to modify an existing neural network in a way that is provably minimal. And so you make the smallest change possible in order to correct your neural network. So all of these things can be reduced 
uh, to neural network verification, and there's really a whole world of new applications that we are just now starting to explore. I'll stop for questions on, on this slide also. Okay, you're all very quiet. So how do we do DNN verification, right? So it's clearly something that we want to do. There are many cool applications, but how do we do it in practice? So I won't go into details on this. This is, this is really my last talk, I'm, my previous talk, uh, but I will give you the high level um, partitioning of approaches into two classes. So one, one common approach is the SMT-based approach. This is just a, a buzzword, but it really encapsulates uh, other approaches as well. But the idea is to take the verification problem and think about it like a set of constraints. Right? And this could be, these can be constraints on the inputs and the outputs and the constraints that the network itself poses. And then you are searching for a satisfying assignment to these constraints. And you're looking for an input that will satisfy all of these constraints together. And the SMT approach for doing this is to say, okay, some of these constraints are easy, some of these constraints are difficult. Typically, the constraints that uh, encapsulate the activation functions uh, are difficult. So we solve the difficult constraints very lazily. We try to ignore them for as long as possible, and sometimes we can ignore them completely without uh, causing our uh, answer to be incorrect. And so this is one thing that we do in the SMT-based approach. And the other is that we repeatedly use deductions to rule out possible assignments. And so remember, we are searching for a satisfying assignment, but we can rule out using deduction rules assignments that are guaranteed to not be satisfying without actually going over and checking them. So these are all things that you do uh, if you take the SMT-based approach. Um, and the project that I'm working on uh, called Marabu implements this approach with some, some other stuff as well, but it's mostly based on this approach and you're welcome to, to go online and, and play with it. Uh, I will also send Katya the slides afterwards so, so you can go uh, and check this out if you want. So this is one approach uh, for DNN verification. And the other very, again, it's a very uh, wide uh, classification, right? So, so there are many ways to do this, but in general, we call this range propagation based approaches. And sometimes this is called abstract interpretation or symbolic bounds or star sets. It has many names. But the idea in general is that you again, look at the input space and output space. And remember, we have our sets P and Q. So now instead of looking for a point in P that is mapped to a point in Q, we are trying to characterize the set of reachable points. Right? So remember, hopefully there are no points in P that are mapped to Q, but the points are mapped somewhere. Right? So, so in this formulation, we say that they are mapped to the set R. And our goal is to prove that R and Q are disjoint, that there is no point that is reachable from P, but is in Q. And the way that we do this is we start propagating P. So we take, we, we think about the geometric shape of P and we start propagating it through the layers of the network. Right? so this shape P is for the input layer. And maybe after one layer, it will look something like this. And so we do some geometric propagation. And after another layer, it will look something like this. And after another layer, it will look something like this. Right? so you propagate the region of, of reachable uh, points through the layers of the network until you get some region of reachable output points. And so this is the blue rectangle here. So this, there is some, some inaccuracy here. There is an over approximation element in almost all of these approaches. So you get more points that are, than are really reachable, right? You get an over approximation and you are guaranteed that the set of reachable points is contained in this rectangle. And if this rectangle is disjoint from Q, then you are happy. And you can say that there is no satisfying assignment and, and everything is good. And there are many tools that implement this also, Iran, NNV, Neurify, Crown, and really a whole bunch of, of other tools. This is a very active uh, field of research also. Any questions? No. Okay. So we're almost done with the survey and soon I'll start talking about uh, recurrent neural networks. So one, uh, one more slide for other things that people are up to. So there is abstraction refinement techniques where you take your neural network and you make it smaller for the purpose of verification in order to simplify the verification problem. This is the spoiler that I mentioned. Uh, if, if we have to schedule another talk at some point, if I'm invited again, uh, then this will probably be the topic. This is something that, uh, that we are uh, working on in uh, my research group. Uh, people are using MILP solvers and Lipschitz analysis and parallelization techniques. These are all things that people are, are working on in order to improve DNN verification. And there's really lots of exciting work uh, in this area. And 
the question that, that people usually want uh, an answer to is what is the current state of the art scalability wise, right? How large are the neural networks that you can verify? So this is very, really a very complicated question because it depends on what you're trying to verify and what kind of neural network and what kind of technique you're applying. But still, as a rule of thumb, I would say that today the state of the art is thousands to tens of thousands of neurons that we can verify. And this is rapidly improving, right? So a few years ago, this would be a few hundred of neurons. And today we can do tens of thousands. So the state of the art is, is uh, improving very quickly. And uh, it's a whole lot of fun to do research uh, in this area. Okay, so one last, uh, one last chance to ask questions about the survey part of the slides. If not, I will proceed to the recurrent neural network stuff. Okay. So let's talk about recurrent neural network. So all the stuff that I mentioned so far, all this amazing work that's been done has focused almost exclusively on feed forward neural networks. So feed forward means that each, well, in our context, means that in each neural network evaluation is independent. Right, so you can think about something like an image recognition network. Right, so if, uh, if you have an image recognition DNN, you give it an image, it gives you an answer. It tells you that this is a panda and the next image is a gibbon and the third image is a dog. And it doesn't really matter what the previous images that the network saw were. Each evaluation of the network is independent. But in some problems, this is not adequate. Right? This solution is not, not great because sometimes you have contexts. Right? So for example, one thing that neural networks are doing or are being used for today is natural language processing. So for example, you might have a network that reads a sentence word after word, and it's supposed to give you back the meaning of the sentence or the sentiment of the sentence. There are, there are certain problems that people want to solve using new neural networks. And the famous example is this sentence, right? You only live once, but if you do it right, once is enough. So when the neural network hits the word it, right? It has to remember the history, the previous words in order to understand what it means, right? So, so clearly it cannot just process each word as a standalone word. It has to remember the context. And there are many examples where this is the case, right? You can't just solve each input on its own. You have to remember what came before. So there really has to be some notion of history. And this is where memory units come into play, right? So in a recurrent neural network, unlike in a fit for neural network, we have this extra construct called a memory unit. So in my, my figures, I will use uh, rectangles or squares to, to indicate uh, the memory units. So, and also the tilde sign. So in this simple neural network, we have, so this is the, the fit for neural network, right? So you have the regular neurons. But now you have a memory unit, V tilde, which is associated with one of the nodes, with node V in this case. And what does this uh, memory unit do? So first it contributes to the weighted sum computation normally. So when you evaluate the network at the first pass, you, you think about this like a normal neuron. Right? So there's a value here, and when you compute the value for V, you take this value and you multiply it by one and you take it for the weighted sum of V. And then the second thing that it does is after you finish evaluating V, you take the value of V and you put it in V tilde for the next evaluation. Right? so V tilde is just a storage unit. It remembers what V had for the previous round and uh, it stores it for the next round. So really it lets you store some sort of aggregated information about all the past values that V had. So a little more explicitly, in this case, we evaluate the node V at time step T. So I will use T superscripts to indicate the time. Right? So if you have four consecutive inputs, then the first one is a time step one, the second a time step two, etc. So V at time step T is evaluated as the ReLU, the activation function of XT plus V tilde T. Right? So you take the input at the T unit of time, you take the value that is currently stored in V tilde, and you use them to compute the value of V. So here is an evaluation, right? So we have here four time steps and we have four different inputs. So four different Xs. At the first time step, V tilde is set to zero. This is by convention. We assume that initially it doesn't have anything stored. And then you compute V, right? So V in this case is X plus V tilde. And once you have the value, you store it in V tilde for the next round. So if you look at the table in each row, V is the sum of X and V tilde. And each row, the, the, relu, the value of uh, V tilde is just the value of V from the previous row. Right? So you get something like this. And these are your, your outputs for each of these uh, time units. So this is the, the concept of a memory unit. And this is what RNNs are built of. Right? The, it's a neural network plus these memory units. 
So these RNNs, these networks with, with memory units are just as vulnerable to problems, right? So it's, it's already been shown that you can do, uh, for example, adversarial inputs uh, and, and, and full uh, recurrent neural networks, for example, in audio recognition. It's, it's really the same thing as feed forward. And so there is a need to verify them. Same motivation as we saw for verifying feed forward neural networks applies for verifying RNNs. And the simplest solution that people came up with immediately, right, we have all this amazing work on, on, on verifying feed-forward neural networks, and now we suddenly have this new problem of verifying RNNs. Clearly, the simplest thing that we can think of is to reduce the problem, right? Take the RNN and reduce it into a feed-forward neural network that you can verify. And then you can leverage existing technology, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's clearly something that you, can, uh, that you want to try. So what is an RNN verification query? Right, so remember for the feed-forward case, we said that we had P and we had Q and we had a neural network, and this was our verification query. What happens when you talk about an RNN? So this is what we had for the feed-forward case, and in the RNN case, we have the same things. So again, P, N, and Q, right, some property on the inputs, some property on the outputs, the neural network. Only now we also have another element called Tmax. Right, and Tmax is just the, the maximal number of evaluations that you intend to use your neural network for. In some cases, it can also be infinity. But for now, for simplicity, let's assume that it's a finite number of steps. So here's an example. Here is my input property. I'm saying that I have five inputs, and I want all of them to be between minus three and three. Right? So I'm putting uh, um, bounds on my x for all time units. x is never more than three and is never less than minus three. Here is my output property. I'm asking, does there exist one of the y's? Right? So in the five time steps that I'm considering, I want to, at least one of the y's to be at least 16. My t max is five. I'm, I'm going to evaluate the network for uh, five time steps. And the neural network is what you see here. And so this is my verification query. And I'm basically saying, look, all of my x's are between minus three and three. Is it possible that at some point y exceeds 16? Uh, remember that y, the output property, is usually the negation of what I want. So I'm really trying to prove that y is never more than 16. Right? But I'm asking as my verification query, is it possible that y exceeds 16? So how do you uh, do the reduction from RNN verification to feedforward verification? Well, this process is called unrolling. Uh, and what you do is you leverage Tmax, and right? you know that you will have at most five inputs, and then you duplicate the network. So here I have one copy of the network. I wrote it, no, I, I rotated it, but it's the same thing. And what I do now is I, multi I uh, duplicate it. Right? So instead of having a memory unit, which I removed, I'm creating another copy of the network and I connect V1 here to be an input of V2 here. So really I'm, I'm simulating the existence of the memory unit. And what happens now is that you get this big neural network that is five times larger than the original. It has five inputs there's no longer a notion of time. You get all the inputs simultaneously, you produce all the outputs simultaneously, but each unit, each uh, occurrence of V is connected to the next occurrence in a way that mimics the memory unit. And what you get is an equivalent neural network that has no longer the notion of time. It's not a recurrent neural network, it's a fit forward neural network. And this one you can verify. And you can verify it using any backend verifier uh, that you want. And this approach is sound and complete, right? Assuming that your uh, underlying verifier is sound and complete. The reduction itself does not cause any inaccuracy. And if your verification procedure is good, then, then you have officially solved the RNN verification problem. But of course, the problem here is the size blow up. Right? So the new network that we have is Tmax times larger than the original. In our example, it was five times larger than, larger than the original. And Tmax is, in practice, if you look at papers where, where people are using these uh, networks, you will see that Tmax can be 100, 200, 1,000. These are uh, realistic values for Tmax. So because the, the verification problem of fit for neural networks is NP-complete, what you get is a huge blow-up. For example, if you have a small network with 10 nodes, but you want to evaluate it for 50 rounds, then your complexity, your worst case complexity, goes from 2 to the power of 10 to 2 to the power of 500. And so this is a very, very bad blow up. We don't want this. So the question is, can we do anything better that will be applicable in cases where Tmax is larger? And this is what I will talk to, talk to you about in the, in the remaining slides. Uh, does anybody have any questions on RNNs, on unrolling, on the reduction? 
don't be afraid to ask questions, please. Okay. So now let's see how we can do this in a more intelligent way. So looking at the same example from before, same neural network. And remember that our query was this, right? We said that X is always between minus three and three, and we wanted to get Y as large as possible, and we wanted to see if it could exceed 16. So if I were to give you this problem to solve, right, you, as, a, as a human, right, you, you probably wouldn't resort immediately to verification, but instead you would think about what this network is trying to do. And after you stared at it for a while, you would probably come up with the solution. You would say, you would ask, what can I say about V at time T? And you would say that V really sums all the previous inputs, right? When an input comes in, you put it in V initially, and then you store it in V prime, in V tilde. And then when another input comes in, you put it in V, you add the previous weighted sum, uh, the previous sum that you had, and you compute V and you again store this. Right, so in other words, V tilde is really storing your partial sums. Every time it remembers what there was in V previously and it adds it to the next round. So you would say, okay, well, there's also the, the ReLU applications that you need to, to consider, but, but roughly what you would say is that V sums all the previous inputs uh, that we've seen. And so there is an invariant. Right, because we know that the input is at most three, V can never exceed three times T. Right, because every input can add at most three, you can never go above three T. And once you have this invariant, you can say, okay, if V to uh, time T is at most three T and T max is five, then I know that uh, V can never exceed 15. And consequently the output Y can also never exceed 15. And so the query is answered. Right, so once you understand this piece of information, this invariant, then you're good. You know that uh, there can never be a violation and you, uh, a, viol um, a violation and you immediately reply unsat and you can terminate the verification procedure. So, okay, so this is all very good, but here we don't have a human in the loop, right? We want to do this automatically. So what we propose in, the, in our ADFA paper is to use an invariant based reduction. So what you do is you take the RNN verification query, which is again, this uh, running example, and you construct a new verification query, which we call phi hat. And it looks like this, right? So you construct a feed for a neural network. And in this neural network, each memory unit V tilde is replaced with a regular neuron VM. And you have a new neuron called T that represents time. And the new verification query that you will ask is this. Your input property P will say that X is between minus three and three. You will have here this component, which is the invariant. You will say that VM is at most three times T minus one. This is the same invariant that we had before, only I replaced T with T minus one. This is a technical thing. It, it really says the same thing that we had before. And T, our time, is between one and five. And the output property is that Y is greater than 16. And we know that if phi hat is unsat, then phi, the original phi, is also unsat. And I, I, I will try to convince you that this is so in the next slide. So this thing that, that we created, we call the snapshot query. Okay, so the snapshot query phi hat, which is what we defined, takes the original P, the constraint on the time that it can never exceed T max and the invariant. And we call it a snapshot network because, or a snapshot query, because you can think about it as if, if you find a satisfying assignment, then you are assigning some value to T, right? So maybe you assign T equals two. So the motivation is that this is like looking at a snapshot of the original recurrent network at time step two. And so this is the snapshot query and the snapshot network. And all the memory units are replaced with regular nodes. P and Q are roughly the same as before. There is a slight alteration that you need to make, but it's technical and I don't want to talk about it uh, right now. You can read more in the paper if you're interested. And T is, well, it should be a new neuron. Ah, T is now a neuron, okay. So instead of being a notion of time, it's, uh, it's a new neuron that you can restrict using the, the input property. So what we add to P is just a restriction on T. We say that T cannot exceed T max and our invariant that needs to bound the values of the memory units which are now replaced with regular nodes. And you can prove that if phi hat is unsat, then so is phi. Okay, so this is the core of the reduction that we are using and it has a certain advantage which we will see it doesn't cause a blow up. Does anybody have any questions on the reduction? Okay, everything is really, really clear. That's good. 
Okay, so, so this, using the snapshot query gives us a reduction from RNN verification to feed-forward verification. So again, you can use existing technology and the technology that is being developed for FFNN verification, which is great, assuming you have the invariant I. Right, so in, in the reduction we saw before, we still had the human, right? Somebody came up with invariant I. And although we automated everything else, we want to, um, you know, to automate this bit as well. The advantage is that the network size that you get is identical to the original, so no blow up in size. We don't have that exponential uh, blow up that is uh, detrimental to unrolling. You just replace each memory unit with a new node, but this is fine, right? This is not, not a blow up because you had the memory unit before also. And you add one node, right? So one node is not a big deal, the one node that we added 40. And the snapshot query, like we said, is an over approximation of the original. If it's unsat, then the original query is also uh, unsat, which is what, what we need. In cases where phi hat is sat, then there is no guarantee about what's happening with phi, right? It can either be sat or unsat, we don't know. In this case, we need to do some kind of refinement. This is stuff that we are still looking into and I won't talk about today. Okay, so now how do you get the invariant, right? How can you uh, get this I uh, that you need in order to, to do the reduction? So our approach is sound, assuming I is truly an invariant. Uh, and that it bounds all the memory units. So what is an invariant? Well, an invariant needs to hold initially, right? It needs to bound the memory units initially, and it needs to continue to hold after each time step. And in the example before, we had the I provided by an oracle. But if, as a first step towards automating this process, we need to have the ability to check. Right? Somebody gives you an, an, or an, uh, an invariant. Maybe it's not necessarily an invariant. Let's just call it an invariant candidate. Right, so maybe as part of an automation process, it's likely that we will have many candidates and we need to check them. So we want a way that will allow us to verify that I is indeed an invariant before we proceed with the snapshot query. And we propose a way to do this using another reduction to fit forward verification. Right, so now assume somebody gives you an invariant and you want to check that it is truly an invariant. And so we solve yet another query, which we call phi I that will tell us whether this I is truly an invariant. If the, specifically, if the query is unsat, then I is indeed an invariant and you can use it. So here's an example, right? So same query, as, same uh, RNN as before, same snapshot network as before. And suppose somebody comes and tells us that this is an invariant candidate, right? The memory unit is bounded by 3T and we want to check. So recall that V tilde time T plus one is V time T, right? This is by definition. And so the invariant that we want to prove is this, uh, that Vm is at most three times t minus one. And this is the same thing, only when you remove the notion of time, this is what, what you get. So how can you check that this is an invariant? Well, first let's check the inductive base. And this we can do on the snapshot uh, network. Right? So at t equals one, by convention, Vm is zero. And this holds, right? Because if it's zero, then it's less than three times one minus one, which is great. So the inductive base holds. And how do you, uh, prove also the inductive step. So this is your hypothesis, right? You assume that the invariant holds at this point in time. So Vm is at most three times T minus one. And what would be the next value of Vm? Well, it's the value that T gets now, right? So because it's an RNN. So the property that you have is that V at this time step is more than three T. Right? This is the negation of the invariant for the next step. And if you get answered for this, which in this case you do, then you know that Q uh, does not, is this, prop, this property is unsatisfiable, so you know that V is at most three times, is, is less than three times T, which is precisely what you need for the invariant to hold in the next time step. Okay, so this is how you can prove that something is an invariant. Any questions? Do you not get, presumably you're going to have to solve this once for each and every memory unit. Do you not get a blow up? So I will um, talk about multiple memory units in a couple of, of slides. So okay. very good question. Sorry. It's even an excellent question because I have a slide about it. Any other questions? No. Okay. So when, where can this process fail? Right? So suppose somebody gives you an invariant candidate and you do this check. What can go wrong? So first it's possible that the provided I is not an invariant. Right? Maybe the Oracle made a mistake. So for example, if, it, if the Oracle tells you that the memory unit is bounded by two times T minus one, right? Previously we had three instead of two here. So for two, it's not an invariant, it's inaccurate. So this will fail, right? When you do the check, you will get a counter example. 
For example, uh, at time step one, when x equals three, you get a violation, right? Because at the next, uh, the, the invariant does not hold for the next time step. So this means that our invariant i is too strong. It's putting bounds that are too tight on the memory units and we need to weaken it. And what does weaken mean? We need a looser upper bound for our memory unit. So this is one possible point of failure. The second point of failure that you can get is that i is truly an invariant, but when you try to use it to prove the snapshot query, it doesn't work. It doesn't imply the, the, the desired property. For example, somebody might come and say, look, here's another invariant. And this is truly an invariant, right? Because if this holds for three, it holds for 100. The bound is much looser. Only this is not enough for proving the snapshot property, right? The snapshot query that if uh, t is less than five, then y is not more than 16. In this case, we say that the invariant is too weak, right? It's not posing um, tight enough constraints on the memory units for us to prove the property that we're after. So in this case, we need to strengthen it. And strengthening means that we need a tighter bound. And so there's a game here, there's a trade-off. So if you think about the sets of all possible invariants, right? so suppose even that we are restricting ourselves only to very simple invariants, like linear invariants, like the ones that we saw. And so each memory unit is bounded by some constant alpha times the time unit. So what you get is the sequence where for very small alphas, you have strong invariants, so they imply the property. And for very large alphas, you always get an invariant, but it doesn't always imply the property. And what you're looking for is the intersection. And you're looking for an alpha that is on one hand small so that it implies the property that you're after, but on the other hand, it's not too small so that it's still an invariant. And in this particular case, Right, what you can do is, is some sort of search, right? In this simple case, you can even do a binary search. Right, so one flow that you can think about is you obtain some invariant candidate i that somebody gives you, and you check. If i is truly an invariant, then, and this you can check by, uh, by solving the query uh, phi sub i. And if you get, so you, you do this test, and if you get sat, then you say, oh, i is too strong, right? You need to make it weaker. And one way to make it weaker is to loosen the bounds on the memory units. Specifically, if you're thinking about uh, the linear um, invariants that we saw, you make alpha bigger. If, however, it is an invariant, then you, you, you use it to construct and solve the snapshot query. If you get unsat, then you are happy. The property holds for the, or, for the original uh, RNN. But if not, you say, okay, my invariant is too strong. I need to, uh, it's too weak, I need to make it stronger. I need to decrease the values of alpha and make my bounds tighter. And then you can try again. Okay, so this is the general flow. Uh, if anybody has any questions, this is a good time. No, okay. Right, sorry, I'll ask. Um, in general, how difficult is it to win this game? Because you have to both tighten and then relax. Um, in, you know, how, is it easy or not when you try to okay. actually use this? Uh, so, so this is a great question. So in general, okay, so, so I'm, I'm setting up for my next slide in which we will try to automatically, I mean, if somebody gives you an invariant, running this check, you know, is easy. The question is, how can you use this process in order to find an invariant that works? And so here, in general, invariant inference is a very difficult, undecidable problem, right? In general, if you have a program with a loop to find an invariant on this, on this program automatically is, is undecidable. So what people are doing usually is they restrict themselves. Right? They say, okay, I'm not looking for a general invariant, but maybe I will look for an invariant that satisfies, that follows some sort of template. For example, the, the linear invariants that I showed you, where you're looking for uh, a bound that is linear in the, in the time step, uh, once you do that, once you restrict syntactically the invariants that you are willing to, you know, to, to consider, it becomes much simpler. And then you can maybe do a binary search and win the game. Um, I ask a question, please. Yeah. Um, so um, when you say the invariant doesn't hold, um, so I see that you don't have uh, any interactive theorem proving here, but um, is there any um, work on where you go um, again to the proof, uh, use the result to refine the invariant? Okay, so so um, I think the, consider other choices of the invariant. Use the results um, to go back to the proof. 
Right, so, so there are some things that you can do, right? So one thing that I think you alluded to is that you can have an interactive prover, right? And you can have uh, a human try to prove this using, I don't know, uh, Cork or Lean or, or whatever uh, tool uh, you want to use. And then perhaps if you bump into a problem, you understand what, what the problem is, and then you can use that information to refine your invariance. So this is one, one path that you could go. We didn't try this because we were interested in a fully automated approach. So we used fully automated solvers. But still, even for fully automated solvers, you could definitely think about some counterexample guided refinement. Right? So for example, here in, in the simplistic uh, version that example that I showed you, you only use the example, the result. Right? If it's sat, you do one thing. If it's unsat, you do something else. But you can also use the counterexample, um, well, at least in, in theory, right, in order to understand how to refine and, and weaken or, or strengthen your invariant. This is definitely something that is worth looking into. And uh, we hope to do this uh, in the future. Thank you. Okay. So our goal, like like uh, we just uh, mentioned, we want to automatically infer the invariants. Right? So where, where do invariants come from? So you can think about an oracle, but really you want to do this automatically. In general, it's an undecidable problem. And so we focused on templates. This, this was uh, my, my answer to one of the previous questions. And this is the linear template that we focused on because it's really quite simple. Right? You bound each memory unit from above and from below using uh, a linear uh, expression in, in time. Right? So it's some coefficient times the time. So if, if you remember this, uh, this figure from before where you are searching for, for your uh, invariants, right? so if, if you are restricting yourself to, to this simple invariant, you can do a binary search. Right? You start with an alpha, if uh, it's not an invariant, you increase. If it is an invariant, but you can't prove the property, you decrease. And this is guaranteed to find the best invariant in this simple case. But, okay, so now I'm, I'm returning to the question from a while ago. What happens when you have multiple memory units? So this is a more realistic scenario. Typically, you don't have just one memory unit in each layer. You have multiple memory units. And then what you want to do is you need to simultaneously prove for an invariant on all of the memory units at the same time. And the reason is that the way that people formulate these networks is that each memory unit affects all of the nodes in, the next, in, the, in this layer, not only the node that it is connected to. Right? So V1 tilde, which stores the previous value of V1, affects also V2. So what you need to do in this case in order to, to apply this approach is to simultaneously prove the invariant over all of your nodes together. And the invariant on one node can affect the invariant on another node. So if I use a specific invariant on V1, on V1's memory unit, this will affect the invariance that I can choose for V2. Right? Specifically, if I strengthen alpha here, then I might have to weaken alpha here or vice versa. There are all sorts of trade-offs. So if we again try to visualize this, right, so we have, so for example, suppose you're considering one bound for V1 and one bound for, for uh, V2. Maybe you're only bounding from above. And right? so there's a certain region where a selection of these values of alpha 1 and alpha 2 is great. This will be an invariant that implies the properties. Uh, that implies the property. And this is the range of possible invariants. And so everything becomes two-dimensional instead of one-dimensional from before. And you can really do the same trick again. Right? You, you start with some candidate and you check, is it an invariant? If it's not an invariant, then you weaken uh, the, the constraint. And if it is an invariant, but it doesn't imply the property, then you need to do some iterative refinement and sort of walk a path and you try to hit a point that is both an invariant and it implies the property. So in the paper that I mentioned, we, su we suggest two, two techniques for doing this. Of course, you have a very high dimension. It becomes more and more complex. But you can think about something like gradient descent. And you start with a very, very, very uh, loose uh, bound, which is almost definitely an invariant. And then you do this iterative gradient-based descent where you, you strengthen it bit by bit, and you try to, to come uh, at an invariant that also implies the property. Another thing that you do, you can do is in some cases you can encode this as a, an LP problem and you can solve it, a linear programming problem, and you can use an LP solver to solve it. And I don't have much time to go into these details, but if you're interested, you can read uh, in the paper or you can come and talk tomorrow at, uh, at the Isaac breakfast. So if there are no more questions on the technique itself, I will give, briefly give you some evaluation results and then we will conclude. No. Okay, so for evaluation purposes, we implemented this technique as a proof of concept uh, tool. Uh, we called it RNN Verify, simply to be the first ones who claim the name. 
Uh, it's available online, and it uses Marabu, uh, the feedforward uh, verification engine uh, that we were working on as a backend, but really you could use other backends as well. And of course, like everybody, we tested adversarial robustness, right? Simply because there are uh, no, uh, no better benchmarks available. By the way, if any of you has more interesting benchmarks that you would want to verify on RNNs, please, uh, we are very interested in, in finding such examples. So the particular networks that we tested on take uh, a voice sample and, uh, and, and they need to classify it into uh, a set of possible speakers. All right, so I will skip this uh, in the interest of time. Uh, well, I, okay, I will, also, I will only say that we tested on uh, Tmax values ranging from two to 20. And so these are the, the values uh, that we tested and we tested on six networks that were not very large, a few hundred neurons uh, each. So previously, I, I, uh, I sometimes had to explain that this is an exponential uh, curve, right? But now in the age of COVID, everybody knows exponential curves. So, uh, so, yeah, so it's not very surprising that when you compare RNN verify in blue, that's our approach, to RNS verify, which is another tool that does unrolling, uh, that you see this exponential blow up. So remember, in unrolling, you duplicate your neural network Tmax times. And so the x-axis here is, is Tmax, is the number of duplications that you need to make. And so when this increases, Right, the verification complexity of the unrolling increases exponentially, whereas our approach is almost indifferent. Right? When you use an invariant, if the invariant is good enough, it doesn't matter what Tmax is. So it's really a constant time versus an exponential growth. So it's really, it's not surprising that um, an invariant based approach has much more potential. And here is a, um, a large amount of numbers, which I don't really expect you to parse, right? So, so this, these are our neural networks uh, that we verified, and these are the different values of Tmax. And what I, I do want you to show, I want, want you to see, for example, if you look at this network, you can see that even Tmax increases the solving time, which is the, the main uh, number that you have here. It's an average solving time over 25 instances, is roughly the same. And so there are, there are certain spikes, so it goes from 7 to 14, then it goes back down, but it's really in the same ballpark, right? It's not, not uh, fluctuating a lot. There are, there are cases where there are fluctuations, but roughly we're not seeing an exponential blow up here. And the other thing that I want you to see is that in some cases, uh, for example, here you see it very well. For a small Tmax, we could prove 25 of our benchmarks, but as Tmax increases, the number of benchmarks that we could prove declined very rapidly. And the reason for this is that we were using our linear invariants that are very simple. And we, can, we hope that once we go to more elaborate invariants, we can, there are cases where these linear invariants are not enough. And once we go to more complex invariants, we think we will be able to improve this. Okay, so to conclude, uh, next steps. So we've seen a general reduction from RNN to feedforward verification, but the really in crucial part is the invariants. And so, Right now, we only use linear invariants. We want to use more elaborate ones, like piecewise linear inv invariants, for example, instead of just linear. And also, we have been focusing on the very simplest uh, kind of RNNs that exists. There are also more complicated variants that are more popular, like GRUs and LSTMs. The difference is that in, is in the way that you update V tilde. Instead, in our example, we just store the value of V in V tilde but you can think about a more elaborate uh, computation, which is what is done in GRUs and LSTMs. So we really want to extend our approach to work on those uh, as well. And of course, more interesting properties. If anybody has such a property, uh, then please uh, get in touch. And that's what I had to say. So if you have any more questions, I'll be happy to answer. If not, if you think about them until tomorrow, I'll be happy to answer them tomorrow as well. Uh, and uh, thank you for listening. Hey, thanks a lot, Guy, for a very clear and uh, detailed talk, as always. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm inviting, I'll, I'll, I want, I have a few questions, but I won't ask them. I, but maybe it's better that to give a chance for everyone else to ask questions. Please just switch on your videos and maybe we'll put a gallery view. Guy, if you um, yeah. mm -hmm. unshare, then you'll be able to see the team uh, as a whole. Okay, now I can see happy faces as well. Yeah, please um, let us uh, check with the audience where, whether they have questions. Virena, immediately I have, have a, a question. Of questions, <clears throat> which um, you know has less to do with the details of your talk, which, um, but more sort of with the general application area. So I'm I'm working in natural language processing. Sorry, 
I'm working na natural language processing. And um, so there are two very popular um, sort of modeling approaches. One is um, anything to do with attention. So, so that's when you basically, um, um, you know, make the RNN or the LSTM um, attend to um, specific things. So attention is used like very widely um, and there's a new now um, instead of like this linearization which you have in that RNN based architecture um, you now replace this with basically only paying attention to different parts of the input so for example <clears throat> in, in NLP you don't feed it in word by word which would be the RNN approach but you feed in the whole sentence and then the model learns to pay attention to different bits of that sentence, right? And the advantage is that um, we don't have this sort of um, vanishing gradient problem. Um, so we basically, um, you know, don't keep everything in mind at the same time, which for NLP is really important if you, you know, refer back to things. And um, so I was wondering, is there any way to also handle attention or is that still beyond sort of the um, current? So I'm not entirely clear. So would you say that the attention uh, formulation that you described, is it still recurrent? Does the network still have a recurrent component? No. So it would probably fall into the feed forward category. Um, so attention, attention is a, just a purely feed-forward mechanism, uh, and but they just massively expand the number of. So in 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 it's kind of going in the wrong direction from what I can see from your talk. In that it is just increasing the number is drastically, it's much more effective than recurrent neural networks from what I understand, at these NLP tasks, but it is at the cost of drastically increasing the size of the network, uh, right. and the number of parameters um... in it. But so ju it's just to make sure, sorry, sorry, Matthew, sorry, there was a delay. Just is it is it those transformers, LSTMs that we are talking about, or something they're else? How, LSTMs. What, what the, they're not LSTMs. But it, they're it's but they are transformers. They're just n terminology. What are they called if people want to Google this stuff? Transformers. Transformers. So basically, um, so this happened about two years ago, where. So first the whole field basically collectively had LSTMs, right? And we had what we call the sequence to sequence models where we basically, we feed one sequence in and we get the other sequence out. So for example, if you've got a machine translation problem, you feed in the sequence of words in one language. And then basically you get the sequence of word out, words out in the other language. And then if you, the LSTM already can have attention, right? So that was then the cool thing which happened that you actually have the LSTM then paying attention to different words in the input. And that accounts for the fact that, for example, you've got languages with different word ordering, right? You're not like just translating every word, word by word, one by one as your output. Or if you've got German, you know, the verb comes last and all sorts of crazy things. So, so that really, really helped um, to introduce attention to LSTMs. And now basically they move to, or we <laughs> move to a very different architectures, which is called transformers, which only has attention. So we are not feeding anything in one by one. You're feeding in the whole sentence or utterance of what you're currently dealing with or tweet or whatever, and then only use attention and yeah, and, and it's true, these models are massive. So there are also um, these, you know, ideas of how you could do model compression, you know, how you can basically, for example, you've got this massive model, which is trained on a lot of data. And then you, you try to learn like a smaller model, which simplifies what you've learned, but still has the same, um, uh, performance. So that's also what reminded me when you were talking about, you know, how can you simplify an RNN, um, but still keep the same performance. So these model compression techniques are, for example, that you've got like a teacher and a student model. So the teachers that massive model like BERT, for example, that's like a really popular model in, uh, in NLP, which is a transformer model, but it's massive, right? It's, it's, and then 
you can't like run it at runtime, for example. So people use like compression techniques, like for example, a student model, which tries to match that performance, um, but with a simpler um, model. So I'm just wondering whether there's anything in, in, in that sort of area, whether, yeah, um, that's, you know, being looked at or. So one thing that, okay, so it sounds like you're asking more about feed forward neural networks, right? So it's, it sounds like the field of NLP is uh, moving away from RNNs. But there are many useful things that you can do with neural network verification. Well, obviously also in the feed forward case. And so for example, if you have this situation that you described with a, a massive model that is the ground truth and you have a, a smaller model that is a compression. Mm -hmm. And maybe after you are done, you are interested in asking, are there any cases where the smaller model makes a catastrophic mistakes, mistake when compared to the larger one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this you could pose as a verification query. Now, of course, if your yeah. ground truth model is very, very, very large, it will be difficult to verify. So, but, but let's, let's say that at least theoretically it's possible, right? We can cast this as a verification query. And then whether we can solve it or not using existing technologies is a different question. Okay. And another thing that I think would be interesting to know, so when we do feed for neural verification, uh, neural network verification, we are interested in, in seeing whether the neural network has a specific structure, specific properties that we can use in order to simplify the verification procedure. So if these transformer networks have some, I don't know, some characteristics uh, that we can leverage, then, then we could probably expedite the verification procedure. But without knowing more about how these networks are built, it's difficult to answer. Okay, thank thanks you. a lot, Guy and Viren. I'm very cautious of time. It's 10 a.m. So, Guy, if you have to go, I have I, a couple of more minutes. Right, uh, but just in case, I'm, I, I suggest what I'll do. I'll invite Guy to our Slack, and we'll create a special channel dedicated to Guy, so that people could uh, send him messages. Because it definitely we're not going to cover all questions, and there will of course be recording. Uh, just yeah, but saying please save your questions. There will be discussion on Slack after that. Any final? question you say you have a couple of minutes guy maybe one, um, one more question yeah one more question if anybody has what sort of structures can you i mean do you view the future of being able to uh, verify really 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 large networks i mean ones that are all in the BERT model that Marina was talking about is uh, 300 million parameters or something crazy uh, do you view it as designing networks? Do you think the techniques will be able to scale that far? Or do you think it's going to be a case of designing the architecture of networks such that they're amenable to? So I think a good uh, comparison can be made to SAT solvers. Right? They're solving a similar problem that is NP-complete. And we know that modern SAT solving technology can scale to problems with millions of variables. So I'm very optimistic about our ability to scale to these larger sizes in a few years. And we're improving rapidly. As for what kind of structures you can use, so I will give you two, uh, two possibilities. So uh, of course there can be others, but one is convolutional net, uh, layers. Right? So if you look at these huge models, typically they have convolution layers that are stored very succinctly. Right? And this is part of the reason that people use convolutions. And today, practically all verification tools that I'm aware of, when they verify a, a network with a convolution layer, they, uh, they simply transform it into a fully connected layer with many zeros. And then they solve the, the, the case that we already know. But currently we are working on smarter techniques that will leverage the fact that it is a convolution, that it has the same weights uh, on, on all the nodes. So this is one thing that you can do. Another thing is this thing that I mentioned with abstractions, where you take a very large neural network and you shrink it for the purpose of verification. And this, if we could characterize, for example, these transformer networks and understand which part of the network is more relevant to the property that we are trying to, to verify, this could serve as a guide as to what parts we should compress, and then we can really expedite verification. So these are two possible uh, angles that we are working, and I'm sure other people are working on other stuff. Excellent. Hi, just a quick, very quick question uh, on invariance. Um, so where, where does the domain, uh, so if the domain of application, like for example in SAT, um, the domain uh, application does uh, have an impact on the hardness of the uh, problem and the encoding. Um, so where do you see the um, domain, does it have an impact um, on the hardness of the invariance and the how 
it tackles your verifier. Yeah, yeah, so definitely. So the simpler the invariance, the easier it is to verify. Uh, so if we are able to come up with some characteristic, you know, we're saying for this problem, these invariants are appropriate, and for that problem, that invariant is appropriate, then that would be a huge step forward. And once you focus on specific templates of invariants, you can really, you know, build your approaches to work better. And, and, and definitely, if we could characterize this, this would be uh, a very important step forward. Okay, probably I'll, I'll keep the questions for the uh, flat thread, like what Katya said. I should so have to and the breakfast meeting tomorrow. Um, yeah. yeah, for people's benefit, there are, there are Isaac breakfasts every Thursday, and they're generally designed only for Isaac team because there are lots of operational issues. But Guy is going to be there. If you want to join, drop me a line, and I will send you a link how to join Isaac breakfast with Guy tomorrow. Um, well, guys, thanks again for coming. Uh, let's continue discussion on Slack, breakfasts, uh, emails, uh, all other means. Okay. Thank you all for listening. It's always fun to, to come and, and talk to you. Thanks again. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.